He is a fourth generation San Franciscan and a retired history instructor who taught at both the secondary and graduate levels. His stories are infused with adventures of relatives who've helped shape San Francisco's past since 1880. In addition, Memories That Linger and In the Rough depict tales of family vacations along the banks of the Lower Russian River. Newspaper critics have hailed his country characters as scalawags of the highest order with few redeem redeeming values. Mm -hmm. A must read. County and state officials recall his take on local politics as too close to the scary truth. So let's welcome John, who will be reading from his Memories That Linger. I want to thank Mona and the Redwood Cafe for hosting this event and for allowing us to, helping us to peddle our, our books. Um, Memories That Linger is a coming of age novel about a young lad by the name of Sean McGinnis. Sean lived at the top of Market Street in the city, and due to the many layers of dense fog outside, he spent most of his childhood summers down in the basement. It was not until years later that he fully appreciated the famous quote by Mark Twain, the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. A new revelation would come to Sean as he and his family took their first serious journey outside of the mist. In the back seat of their station wagon, Sean was wearing his three layers of clothing. They started to climb the foothills of Marin when a curious development lay ahead. He saw a rainbow gift wrapping a portal. He raised an eyebrow and wondered what exotic treasures lay on the other side. And as they exited this tunnel, he did not find a trove of gold Spanish coins, but something far greater, an orange ball, an orange ball that rested in the sky. It was blue, blue sky. This did not compute. The sun and Memorial Day weekend was not supposed to come out for another three months. And he raised an eyebrow at the prospects to come. They traveled, motored for another two hours, and pushed their way through the signal lights of 101 until they came to a two-lane country road that led the asphalt and concrete behind. They meandered over meadows and rolling hills toward a scallop bridge. A forest grew nearer and nearer. Trees grew larger and larger to the point that they pinched over the entire world. War. To Sean's eight-year-old mind, this looked like some secret passage. And they meandered through the dark narrows and came out and traveled across an ancient bridge. He thought for sure it was the gateway to some playland forgotten, some playland of yesteryear. He looked down below this old railroad trestle and saw a calm ribbon of water. And he wondered, to where does this river lead to? To what yet unknown destinations and uncatalogued creatures? At the end of a couple of miles of vineyards, they took a right-hand turn and dipped underneath a sign that read, Rionito, Memories That Linger, and entered a hidden village with a seven dwarfs motif. And Sean saw all these kids running around with a smile that was similar to his, wearing nothing but a white t-shirt, swim shorts, and black Converse tennis shoes. And he looked at one of the small markets nearby, and he thought he had found perhaps the source of part of this gladness. The market advertised a limited supply of ropes of li uh, licorice, milk duds, and juju beads, and diabrite. And next door was an ice cream and soda park. Next to that was a pinball arcade. Next to that was a three-lane bowling alley outdoors. And then came rows and rows and rows of benches that faced an outdoor pavilion. 
he could sense the burning embers from a forgotten fire. And he pictured himself over the blaze with perhaps a marshmallow at the end of his stick. They scooted around a country tutor and made their way up one of the seven canyons carved out of redwoods. As Sean and his family came back to Reunido year after year, as Sean got to know better the lay of the land, his expectations for excitement and adventure grew to the point at the ripe old age of 14, he was ready to take on the world. To help with his tasks, he invited two of his grammar school buddies, Tom and Bobby, and they were ready for adventures indeed. They would put aside their first kiss, which they had experienced with the female gender years previous, and were looking for greater romance. They would always have their mother's peppermint Chesterfields available, but they thought they'd try this new cigarette called marijuana, as they called smart sticks in those days, and perhaps they needed some help to expand the miasma of their brain. After all, the rigorous academics of high school lay just ahead. And if they ever needed any encouragement or inspiration, they always had Marilyn, the first centerfold that first year of Playboy. Or perhaps this new genre of music called rock and roll, Bill Haley and Comets, and Little Richards, Tutti Frutti, perhaps Billy Holiday or Roy Orbison. In any case, a crisis comes knocking on Sean McGinnis's family door. A crisis that takes him to the brink of adulthood and far beyond. At the same time, there are persistent rumors circulating through Rio Nido that the big band is fading fast, that this could be the last summer for Harry James and the Dorsey brothers that just reunited, but Cab Calloway come and gone. And also, there was a city, the little biggest city in the world, at the end of the newly constructed Highway 80. And not to forget Vegas and Hawaii were now practical destinations for the commercial airlines. I Love Lucy was making a hit, and other sitcoms were taking the place of the radio TV shows like the Tesco Hour, all competition for Rio Nido. So there was one burning uncertainty, one question that had to be answered by Sean and, and his neighbors, that is, would they survive the tumultuous summer of 1953? So thank you. The short answer is, I don't know. Uh, the, uh, it's supposedly is buried in some warehouse or at some private domain. The person whose family owned most of the village, Claire Harris, is the hands-on operator of Johnson's Beach. If you ever go to Johnson's Beach and you want to rent a kayak and you see a gentleman in his 80s, that's Claire Harris. He was the contact person for the big bands, and, uh, and he owned the, the Renio Village, the Lodge, and the Bowling Alley, and, and so forth. He knows where the sign is, he's not telling <laughs> I left, I'm not sure I heard your question correctly, but I left the sign on the book as the title. So if you look at the book carefully, the old sign was a black wire mesh that you could see through. Um, it, it's not a question, it's just an observation. Um, you know, I think it was wonderful the way you just spoke it and did it great. I, I just love that. It was just it was so great, five stars. Thank you. <laughs>